so welcome. Um, this is the talk on making Drupal less daunting. And my name is Jill Maraca. I'm probably going to sit down for half the presentation because this is, this is low, but I thought um, I'll stand for now and introduce myself. So I am, my title here is the Associate Director of Web Development Services uh, at Princeton University. I've um, been here for over 19 years. Yes, I started when I was 15, <laughs> I tell people. Um, and um, I've been making websites here at the university for that long, and then uh, prior to that I was making websites at a very small startup before coming here. And so my role here is I manage a group called Web Development Services. You remember us as WDS, We Do Sites. That's our acronym, WDS, We Do Sites. Um, and so we make a lot of websites for the university. Uh, the main university site was developed by us, designed by uh, another company, um, and we um, have made hundreds and hundreds of sites, and we host over a thousand sites. So our day-to-day -day is, is working with departments, centers, programs, labs, to make their web presence. And we do that um, on Drupal, primarily on Drupal, and we also do run a WordPress system here, but we are, we are primarily Drupal designers and developers. And so my team consists of um, project managers, uh, developers, designers, and content strategists. So that's the makeup of our team. And that's, that's what we do here. So a little bit more about myself. Let's see if I can get this to work. Um, yeah, I just sort of, that's me. Um, my background is actually in design. I started as a graphic designer and then naturally moved into the web. So um, that's my background. So I love design, I love usability, and right now accessibility is a big part of my job. So the university has guidelines and we do need to meet uh, WCAG 2.0 AA. And you'll see there's a number of accessibility talks um, going on today because I think the topic is coming up more and more. Um, and I started working with Drupal in 2010. So that's, that was where I started. My first Drupal conference was um, DrupalCon Chicago in 2011. So that's how I sort of mark my Drupal experience. Um, so I was thinking about this talk, you know, I, I realized that Drupal is a, it's a very powerful content management system. And it, it, it can be a challenge uh, to get started in Drupal. Um, and I wanted to speak to you know, anyone who's maybe not technical, who's a beginner, who, who wants to know where to get started, and just you know, share my experience um, getting started. So um, you know, when I was thinking about the presentation, I started to think about not only just my experience starting with Drupal, but other experience I've had where I've had to start something and then learn and, and, and figure it out. So, um, a couple years ago, I started to teach a class um, down the road at the College of New Jersey. I don't know if anyone's familiar with that um, College of New Jersey. I'm, I'm an alum. So, <laughs> um, so uh, they had um, a call out. They needed, they needed an adjunct to teach a class. And I looked at the syllabus and I thought, oh, wow, I know all this. I know HTML, I know CSS, and you know, I can teach this class. And, oh, okay, there's a little bit of JavaScript. I'll, I'm, I'm okay at that, but I'll just brush up. And there's some PHP. And I'm like, well, I know the basics. You know, I can teach this class. And um, I, I got the job, and um, this is still while working full-time here. This is like my night gig. So, as if I wasn't busy enough here, I just said, let me do more. But um, long story short, it was actually a really rewarding experience. But my point really is, you know, I had to, I knew the syllabus material, but there were all these extra bits and pieces that, that went along with it. You know, I had to do like paperwork and I had to figure out where to park and I had to get a card. <laughs> I had to like figure out where my classroom was and then I had to remember the code to my classroom. Um, and then I had to remember the students' names. And then I had to learn Coursera, not Coursera, Canvas. That's where, um, if anyone's familiar with you know, university, it's sort of the, like a blackboard, a learning management system. Well, I had to learn that, and I'm like, oh, you know, I, there's this uh, sort of core set of skills I knew, you know, I could teach the class, and then there's all this other stuff I had to learn. And the first time, it was overwhelming. 
And that was uh, sort of related to my Drupal experience. I'm like, well, I know websites. I can make websites, and I know HTML and CSS. But then, like, all this other stuff you have to learn. And, st and that's, you know, my, that's how I related my experience to learning Drupal. And um, it was overwhelming, and I did have to learn all these things. Um, but I, I taught the course, I actually taught it twice, so the, the first time I wasn't, you know, scarred or anything, I was, I was able to teach it. Um, and it reminded me of Drupal. And so if you, uh, some of you might have seen this. <laughs> this is the illustration I wish would go away with Drupal. So um, for those in the back where it's small, these lines represent other content management systems. So, and the black line represents Drupal. And there's, there's a clip, there's this learning clip. Yeah, so <laughs> when I was starting to teach, this was like me learning um, Canvas, like, oh man, and then figure out where to park. That was actually a little easier down here. And uh, remembering the code in my room, I just forgot it a number of times, just wrote it down. And, um, you know, once once you're going, you know, it's all good. But, but this is, you know, this is Drupal. It's something that I think that the community is doing, um, is making an effort to, to change this. So, um, with Drupal, I, I thought, you know, what, what am I getting myself into? You know, when, when you first start something, you don't really know what you don't know. You just think this is going to be great. It's Drupal, but you don't really know what you're going. You don't know, and. Um, I, I put together for this talk some of my thoughts. So and maybe let me just sort of get a sense of, of who's in the room. How many people have been using Drupal for more than for five years or more? Anyone five years or more? Okay, so there's. Okay, good. How about three years or more? How many people like a year or less? Okay, okay, so that, that's good to know. Okay. All right. So, you know, I put together some points for the presentation. What are the basics, just basic concepts, um, things I wish I knew in 2010 when I started, um, tips for getting started, and then you know, so, some tips for selecting a vendor, selecting someone to work with. Okay. So first, let's do some basics first. Okay, I've got some like I've got some giveaways for this part. This is sort of the interactive part of my presentation. Okay, so for the for the a content type is a customizable, b a basic page, c formerly known as note types, d all of the above. And just raise your hand if you you know think you know the answer. D. D. Who said D? Okay, that's right. So you're getting a. This is our Princeton Drupal sticker. A Drupal tiger. <laughs> <laughs> see, see it on the top of my laptop. Okay. Yes. So yes, the, the content type is is all of those. Drupal core is official Drupal files. The center of Drupal. Something you work out at the gym. <laughs> Do the thing that's left when you've eaten enough. Anyone? Definitely doing C now. See? Yeah. B. B, uh, almost, yeah, it, it, you can think of it as, as the, it's the core, it's the center, it's the, yeah. And anybody else? There's actually two, two right answers. A. 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 Okay, somebody raise their hand. Somebody raise their hand for A. Did you I just blurted it out. Oh, or blurted it out. Yep. That works too. That works. <coughs> Yep, that's right. So that's Drupal core. A module is a way to extend Drupal. B, a set of PHP, JavaScript, and or CSS files. C, something you can turn on and off. D, all of the above. D. D, D. yep. I'm just going with who I heard first. Uh, a theme is what my presentation needs. <laughs> D, what's for lunch. C, a set of files that define the visual look and feel of your site. And D, what my middle school teacher made me write. C. C. Thank you. Okay. A distribution is A, features for a specific type of website. B, a single download. Oh, my 
the spacing is off. The designer in me cringes at that. C contains modules, themes, and configurations. And D, oh, all of the above. D, all of the above. <laughs> it's D, all of the above. Okay. Oops. Technically, not the distribution can be not a single download. It could be multiple, yeah. It could be, yeah. And it, it can be a single, yes. Good point. Thank you. Okay. True or false? You are hungry for lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I just threw that in there. Just being the talk before lunch, if you didn't eat breakfast, can be can be tough. Uh, okay. So, so these basic concepts are um, things that you would start out learning when it comes to Drupal. So, content types, uh, modules, themes, Drupal core, and distributions are all are all the basics. And then let's see if I've got an example. So what I mean by this, and, and you know, for the for the experienced folks, um, bear with me because you probably know some of this. So a content type is um, I'm going to show you a demo right here. So here at um, Princeton, we have this demo site. Um, this is our system for making websites. Uh, we call it our Drupal template system. Um, it's, it's sort of a distribution of Drupal that we just use here at Princeton. And it's a multi-site Drupal. Um, but a content type could be something like a basic page. Or um, a news item. Or an event. Okay. And a content type um, is, is what we call structured content. So it can have a title, date, who's it by, um, the body, um, and it can have an image. Okay, so some of this is probably, is probably familiar. But it's sort of these building blocks and these concepts of like, you know, where, where do you learn to park? What's the code to get in the building? Um, and so these are the basics that I, that I started to learn. So then, um, beyond the basics, you know, there's a lot of, this is, I'm not going to go into where to get started to learn. There's a lot of places you can go to, to start. Uh, the Drupal 8 user guide would be um, where, if I were to start today, that's where I would, I would go. Um, it's on Drupal.org. And you can see, you know, I took this excerpt from the guide. It's also aimed at people who already have some experience with Drupal, um, but they want to expand their range of skills or knowledge or update them to the current version. Um, and, and 8 right now is, is what is the cur current version. Um, I still have many, many websites in Drupal 7, um, but 8, you know, if I were to start fresh and learn Drupal today, I would start with 8. So maybe just to gauge who's here. How many folks are using Drupal 8 and building sites in Drupal 8 right now? Okay. A couple of people. Good. Okay. Um, so that's the user guide. Okay. Uh, then I put together the top five um, kind of concepts. These are the concepts that I wish I knew in 2010, and these are the concepts that I found um, most difficult to kind of absorb and learn, because they were just, they were a shift in, in how I thought about building websites. Okay, so number one, content types are awesome. Pretty much every website I start with, we start with a discussion uh, about what, what are the content types. And some of the content types are uh, as simple as, as what we call the basic page, or just a page. It's just got a title and it's got a, a, a blob of text. But content types are great because you can uh, consistently format them. So every news item is gonna have consistent fields and a consistent style. Um, you can make different views of the content type. So for example, and I can just, sh I'm more of a show and tell sort of person. Um, on our news content, you can see here, we call this the list view. It's just one on top of the other. Okay. But we also have a view of the news that is, um, oh, we still have the list. Oops, sorry, I thought we had a better demo than that. Um, let's go to people. People is a content type. Okay. So people can uh, show in a list. Or they can show in a grid. Right, so, mm -hmm. I went with dead presidents. And so they're side by side. My resolution is also making this a little tricky to see. Same content, 
different view of the content. You know, the word the word view, um, I think, is a, is a good descriptor of it. You can categorize them, so I can put my people, uh, my person content type into different categories. Faculty here is mostly faculty, staff, student, and then create list views of that. So it's the power of content types. And um, one tip I would say is try not to create too many. Too many content types can make an overwhelming um, editing experience. So for example, th this, is a, this is a common thing that comes up when building a site. So I showed you lists of people and those, those people were in the content type, the person content type. And that works well when you need to categorize people, faculty, staff, and create different lists, and then have a list of everybody. But it doesn't work well if you just need a simple list of people and you're never gonna categorize them, you're not gonna put them in a different view. If you just have one page with a list of people, just list them on the page. Because I find some uh, sites have gotten carried away with content types. So content types are awesome. Don't get carried away. Think, think through. Okay, second, second concept. Uh, views and content types are perfect together. So I sort of alluded to that when I showed you. You can make, also, this is just a limited list. You can make tables with sort of, sortable fields out of a content type, grid layouts, um, teasers. Does anyone know what a teaser is? Yep, yeah, so do you want to? Oh, no, no, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, help me out here, kind of. Uh, Sorry. Teasers are, um, let's say I have a news item, and my news has a headline, and then it has a story. If I just want to show a couple of them, I just show a few lines from the story. That's the teaser. To get you to read the rest of the story. And then you exactly. click to read the rest. Exactly. Yes. Your yep, exactly. Um, calendars, on-screen slideshows, and more. Um, so that was a concept that um, when I really fully grasped it with Drupal, it was like, yes, content types and views, you can really do a lot of um, interesting stuff with. Okay. The third thing, this is the moving stuff, I just put it in quotes, moving stuff gets complicated. Um, so what, what you're looking at is this um, Git branching model. I spent a lot of time looking at this diagram and figuring this out. And really kudos to the web development services developers for explaining to me, you know, explain this to me about 1,500 times. <laughs> um, where do I want to start with this diagram? So, so first of all, I guess, who is familiar with this concept? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what this is showing, I'm probably going to do a bad job of explaining this, but we've got um, this, these lines represent our code, okay? So when you're working with Drupal code and you're working on uh, multiple sites and multiple developers are working on it, it's not just you and one site, you have branches of, of code. And some of these branches, um, gonna re this is going to represent the development branch. So this is, these are things you're working on. This is in progress. Um, this is what we call the master branch. This is uh, on production, and it's usually live. And then all of these points represent um, features that someone is working on. So it, it, it's sort of like this tree trunk and there's branches. Um, and I'm just, I am, over, I am overly simplifying my explanation right now. But just so you know that understanding this was, was a big challenge for me. And when you're working on a team of developers and multiple people are contributing to the master branch, it, it can be um, a challenge and, and the developers have to get used to working. There's multiple people working on the code, not just one person. And they have to understand that there's point releases there's hot fixes, and then there's branches. Number four, the cache is a big deal. It's so big, it's on shirts, sweatshirts. <laughs> um, my first Drupal conference, my second Drupal conference, uh, I think it was DrupalCon London, it was uh, a perfect keep calm and clear cache only with the Drupal logo. Um, so the cache is a big deal. This is something I also had to spend a lot of time learning. 
And the cache is, um, you know, your browser is storing things. I'm also overly simplifying my explanation right now. But clearing the cache to see new features, new contents, you know, essentially refreshing the screen is a big deal. And the way Drupal handles it can be complicated. And oftentimes when something has gone wrong, we were just saying, it, keep calm, clear the cache, and it'll be okay. But there are also different caches. There's your browser cache. Right, and we can all clear that just by hitting the refresh button. But there's other, um, there's the Drupal cache, and that also um, sometimes has to be cleared. Any any folks in here? Uh, does this resonate with anybody? Yep, the cache is run into, mm -hmm. you've run into problems. Yeah, some nods. Yeah. Fifth thing was hosting. Um, don't forget about this. Uh, what I see happen at Princeton is um, some departments. So. so just I'll back up a minute. Not every department needs to host a site in the central hosting system. They can go out, they can work with a vendor, and they can host it kind of wherever they want. And often that's um, a forgotten step in, in the process. Where is this going to be hosted? And um, does the site need to talk? to university systems that are still running locally. So if you're building a site and your, um, your site needs to talk to another system, either get data from it, read or write to it, if you host in a particular place and that other system doesn't allow your site to talk, um, that you're gonna hit a, a big blocker right there. So in our case, we are hosting in, in Acquia, so we host our sites in Acquia. And um, we were early cloud hosting adopters and some of our campus systems that still run here on campus, for a reason, there's some good reasons, um, we had to t work with those owners to get them to open things up so we, they could talk. So, so think about hosting, where your site is, is ultimately gonna run. Um, and now I put together some tips for how to make Drupal less daunting. Okay. What I would say is uh, there's two, two things. This is beyond reading the getting started and you know, some intro videos. Uh, but beyond that, you can try the evaluator. Has anyone tried that? I'm, just gonna, I'm gonna play a short video. Let's, let's see if this is gonna work. Um, so I follow this blog by Dries, and he wrote an article back in September that I think really resonated with me and making Drupal easier to, to get into. And um, anyone read this article? Yeah. Maybe, maybe you did, and it's been a while. Um, and what he showed here is that um, getting this Drupal CMS installed took 20 plus clicks and 15 minutes to get going. To me, if I were starting on Drupal, that would be kind of daunting and I might go, oh, I'm going to WordPress, what the heck with this? Symphony took three clicks, WordPress took seven, um, Laravel took three, and here's the time, okay. Um, so what the, the Drupal, um, and his name, I'm giving credit, Matt, Matthew, Grasmick, I hope I'm saying that right. I'm sorry, Matthew. He um, he worked to evaluate the time and then make it easier. Okay. So this is going to be this is the 30 click version. We're not going to watch that. Um, but you can see here that what they were doing was you know have a better getting ex getting started experience. And so they have de they've improved it. The, um, there's a better download page. There's an evaluator guide. Let me show you what that looks like. And so you'll find it here on Drupal.org. There's some requirements, but you can start and download Drupal. So here it is in less than two minutes. Let's see if I can.
Okay, so that's getting started. Now, there's other ways you can, let's get out of this screen. There's other ways you can get started. Some um, hosting companies and such, they'll provide a, a cloud hosted version of a starter site and you, could, you can get started that way. This is just, if you are you know, going with the open source code locally, you're not gonna be tied to a particular hosting provider. This would be um, where, I, where I would start. So that's the evaluator. Um, the second thing I would try is I would try starting with a distribution. Okay, so distribution is uh, a, a downloadable file or files. Where's, where's multiple files? <laughs> he, he knew that. He, um, and it's uh, pre-configured for a certain need that you have. Okay. One such distribution is the lightning distribution. For the main Princeton University site, we actually um, we started with this. It's, it's since morphed into, we're not quite lightning right now, but it is a starter uh, distribution. Things are configured for you, and uh, there's less work that you have to do to get going. So um, when folks talk to me about Drupal and how it, it is difficult to get started, the way I describe, describe Drupal is that Drupal is um, out of the box. It's a lightweight content management system. It makes no assumptions about you, what you're going to do with it. It's a lightweight content management system. And you then build your content management system on top of it. So it's a, I almost think of it as a, as a content management system framework. And so when you, when you start Drupal and you download Core and you're like, Oh, this doesn't do much. Well, I think that that's intentional because you then extend it with the modules, with the themes, with the content types and such. And, and, and to me, I, I feel like that's probably one of the, the basic concepts that people's, you know, people, their first impression of Drupal is, this is like, this is it, this is all it does. You do have to work to get it um, to a point where it's, it's the content management system you want it to be. And so that's the purpose of distributions. So Lightning, it, it you know, gets, gives you a jump start. It gives you, a, uh, 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 it makes a lot of decisions for you. Um, actually, I got a lot of stuff open here, don't I? There's other distributions such as Open Social. Okay, Open Social. You see, it's an out of the box solution for online communities. Um, I think the UN is using this for some other needs. And it takes Drupal core, the, the basics, the base things, and it adds modules on top of it and other configurations. And then you can just you know, hit the ground running with the distribution. Okay. So in one example, victims support the Netherlands. <coughs> And there's other needs. So I actually don't use Open Social, but you know, it's just sort of an example of you know, uh, taking. They've taken Drupal Core. They've done a lot of the work for you. You take it, and then you use it. What else? Okay. So then, shifting, shifting gears to to working with vendors. Um, so let's say you're. You're, um, you're not going to build your website yourself. You need to work with someone. You need to choose a vendor. There's the traditional considerations. You know, what does the portfolio of their work look like? Um, do they come with good recommendations from other folks who have used them? Um, can they be on site? Can you see them in person? Are they in your time zone? I, I've, I've worked with folks in Sweden. It's very hard because I send an email and then I, you know, to kind of almost, tw depending on when I send it, it's like 24 hours later I get an answer. Um, do they have industry knowledge? You know, do they understand your domain? So in this case, when I hire a vendor, it would be someone who understands higher education. So these are, I think, are, the, are some, some of the traditional considerations, not, not all. Um, then I thought, you know, what, what else? I think the other considerations you need to think about are the editing experience. Have them show you the behind the scenes of what they've built. 
right? So oftentimes when you're looking at someone's portfolio of work, you're like, this is shiny, this is sleek, there's images and flyouts, and this looks really great, and the fonts are great. And um, behind the scenes, it's very difficult for the website owner to, to edit. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've seen websites where they've got this great ambient video playing and then it's there for like two years. And I, I often wonder, whoever built the site, did they make it easy for a non-technical person to swap that video out? Um, or did the site owner just, you know, say, well, forget about it, I don't have time to put in another video. But, but you know, my point is I've seen sites that are just, they're very difficult to maintain. And if they're difficult to maintain, the, the, the website owner, the person producing the content, is just, just, just not going to take the time to update it. So that's one tip. I, I'd say have them walk you through how they um, set up sites. So have them walk you through a content type, what it's like to edit, what, it, what is it like to edit a view, can you edit the view? Um, they, they might have hard-coded things and you, you can't change the view. And the system I showed you, it was demo.princeton.edu. We make it such that the website owner can change the view. If you don't want your list of people on a list and you want them in a side-by-side -side grid, you, you can make that switch. Because um, you don't want to be tied to uh, the, the company who originally made the site. Oh, you want that little change? Oh, you got to come back to us. That's a fee. Um, and in the, the presentation right before mine, you know, there's um, a point made where there's a lot of just just not good website building going on there. So I think point one, it might be one way for you to sort of vet that and see what's going on behind the scenes. The second point is the project process. It, is their project process something that you can work within? Um, is it comfortable enough where you can provide input um, at your pace, right? So here at the university, we have a pace that takes into account the academic calendar. Like during commencement week, we know we are not gonna get anybody to approve something that we've developed on their site. They're just busy doing other things. And so you wanna make sure that you're, the person you're working with, the company you're working with, will take into account your busy periods. Um, and you know, there's a lot of um, talks on the agile process and um, co continual feedback. Uh, so also, you know, think think about that. What points of the project can you provide feedback? You know, I feel like ultimately, if you're working on a contract, you know, with with another company, there does have to be a start and there does have to be an end, right? They've got other projects that they have to move on to. So there's a start of the project, there has to be an end, there is a budget, so there's sort of a wall. Um, and in the middle, can you be a little agile in there? So I like to call it agile with a waterfall wrapper. That's sort of how I describe it, start and end. Because if it's just ongoing agile, then you're months and months and, and expenses and expenses. And then support after the project is done. You know, or is that a team of people going to be there to support you, answer your questions, documentation, um, and such? So those are three other points. Um, and then also think about uh, hosting and the ongoing maintenance. Okay, so what is it? Every once a month there are security announcements made uh, by Drupal.org. You know, this module has a has a patch. This has got something. Who is going to keep up with that? Once a week. Once a week, more like once a week. Yeah, right. So who will keep on top of that? Yeah. Um, so what else? So I thought let me ask um, ask the audience. So anyone worked with a vendor, uh, and any tips that you can share with us? Good experience, bad experience. Something you wish you did differently. Something you want to forget about. <laughs> I mean, yeah. we used to. We used to have. Are you talking about like the hosting provider or? What any anything? Yeah, hosting provider experience. Sure. Sure. We used to get hosted on Black Match because our company was attracted to the security. Uh, at, well, the alleged security advantages of working with them, uh, mm -hmm. since they they had their own 
cloud themselves and were allegedly focused on security, uh, but the service proved to be uh, too uh, too much of a problem. Like there was downtime just because their whatever they were doing on their end was not good. So uh, eventually we had to drop them because it was just not acceptable mm -hmm. for the site to be down for reasons we couldn't control. Yeah. Yep. That's, yeah, that's a good point. You know, it, there, there's a lot, if you're starting a site, there's a lot that goes into it. You've got to think about, well, how's it look and what are the pages? But then, like, where is it running? How's the performance? Um, what is the uptime? And sometimes when you're negotiating these, the contract with a hosting provider, do they make a guarantee of the uptime? And sometimes they'll say, like, 99.999%, which sort of equates to can you accept 15 minutes of downtime a month? or two hours of downtime a month. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, so in our case, we do we host on, on Acquia, and um, we, which, is, which is on the Amazon Cloud. And in our contract, we do have, if one region of the Amazon Cloud goes down, we um, fail over in some manner to another region. So if, what is it, Virginia gets hit by a nuclear blast, it, we website's still up because it's somewhere <laughs> else, but we got bigger problems if, if that happens. Yeah, sure. Um, and another point with, with hosting, so in their, your case, Black Mesh, they're probably, their hosting infrastructure was probably pretty secure, but then it's that application, the Drupal application, who secures that? Yeah. So sort of think of things as layers. There's the hosting, and then there's the Drupal that's running on the hosting. Who's securing both those things? Yeah, the all is support, so when something happens, particularly when you are uh, kind of dealing with the external hosting providers, mm -hmm. what kind of support and ticketing mechanisms they have, yeah. and what's the SLAs of that? Yes, yeah, yeah, Ex yeah, exactly, yeah. So the, all questions to ask when you're picking a hosting provider, are there different um, priority levels of tickets, and, and what does that mean? So if I, if I put in a high priority ticket, uh, I'm just making this up. Uh, do I hear from someone in an hour? If I put in a really high priority ticket, do I hear from someone in 15 minutes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. How how do you changing to a different? Um, how do you handle the the request for changes in your in your features? For example, the mm -hmm. the grids, the in the in the views yeah. mm -hmm. uh, from because I'm pretty sure you have. Because even a lot of users, they all yes. want something, and they're all—it's super important that I get this now. Yeah. How do you, how do you incorporate that into your mm -hmm. lines and structures and all that? Yep. So how do you prioritize it. That's, I mean. Yeah. Uh, yep. Great question. So um, for anyone who didn't hear, it's how do we prioritize? Um, request for changes. So, the, in, for example, a view. So, if, let's say I want to change the, the the person page from a list to a, a picture grid. So, um, there's there's two ways we prioritize. One is if you're in what we call our Drupal, our template system, that's uh, our distribution. We actually, if you ask me to do that, then I would say here's the instructions. Go try it yourself first, because we do allow people to change the view in that manner. Um, and the, technically the way it's done is we, we built that on, on something called Panoply. Um, so that you can log in and um, you can actually drag and drop things around and you can actually click the little gear icon and say change from list to grid. So, so that would be, first we'd say try it yourself. If we've built you a site where um, we haven't built you in this template system, we've built you a custom Drupal site, that's where we built it from scratch. Well, scratch, we do have a base code, but anyway. And you can't, you don't have access to the views. Um, what we would do is we, we basically put you into our queue, and then we, we say, well, we're gonna get to it either this week or next week. M most of the time, people aren't suddenly like, oh my god, we need a grid versus a view. It, it, they don't come up that urgent. Um, so I've talked about, I'm kind of going to my, really into Princeton specific stuff, but we've got this template system, we've got this, we've got custom Drupal sites, and just to give you a, a, a magnitude of the scale, in our Drupal 7 template system, we've got, don't quote me on this, like 280 sites. And if 280 different people came and told us we need to change this and that, we, we couldn't handle that. So we try to make it as uh, user friendly and as editable as possible. Our custom Drupal sites 
we've got about 40. Okay? And now we're actually starting to build Drupal 8 sites. Um, so we do prioritize. But I want to maybe circle, you know, dive into this template system a little bit more. So this template system, I, I call it the, um, it's sort of like our Princeton Squarespace, kind of like do-it-yourself, build-a-site system. Um, we, when we roll out features to that system, every site gets the feature. And we have a um, Bitbucket issue tracking system, and we do prioritize in there. Okay, five departments have asked us for X feature. Let's bubble it up, and we actually have a monthly release cycle for that system. Um, but the basic views and things, we, we tell people, here's the instructions, go, go try it yourself. Then when they get stuck, they can call us or sit with us, and then we'll, we walk them through doing it. Too. Thank you. Um, okay, so I just want to say a note about the Drupal community. I feel like I've been part of it since 2010. They have been, it's just been super positive. Um, ways to get involved, you know, this, this is a great way to get involved. I, I, I think it's a great group of, of folks who just want to do good things with code. I love that Drupal is an open source software. If you don't like what it does, I say, okay, well then go contribute to the module. Go suggest a patch. Um, you, you, you can contribute and there's ways to contribute. I also recommend attend a meetup. We have the, um, in this area, the Central New Jersey Drupal group. And the meetup, uh, actually, does it take place in this building? Sometimes it takes place in this building. Meets here. Meets here, yeah. Second Thursday of the month. Second Thursday of the month. It's in the evening and you're all welcome to, to come to this meetup. Well, there's Drupal Camp. Okay. So if, you've never, if you're not familiar with the meetup group, you're welcome to come. They also, I think, and I think they still just, they have um, co-working sessions. I recommend co-working because, you know, on your own you can listen to a video and learn. And, um, but co-working, I think, is great because you can sit side by side with someone and kind of talk through a problem and work it out. And people in the Drupal community, in my experience, are, are more than willing to share um, how to's and what they've learned and walk you through how they'd solve the problem. Do you and, know of any co-working sessions here in Princeton? Um, just the, the meetup used to have them every so often. Uh, I don't remember if they still do. Tomorrow there's actually a mentoring you know, session. So I'd say check back, check the meetup, and see if they have any uh, co-working sessions scheduled. And then, of course, there's the bit, there's the conference, there's DrupalCon. First DrupalCon I went to, I mean, I, mean, I was a deer in the headlights. I thought, whoa, there's a lot to learn. So, second one, and the third one, probably, still. Then I got it. Can you suggest working, cold, working, yeah. <laughs> Can you suggest for the meetups, like, to create a co-working co session or something? Is yeah. That something that's possible? Yeah, definitely, yeah. Um, so the organizer, if he, I, I show this really quickly, is um, Peter and three other people. Peter, Sean, and David, and Brian. They're all here today. Yeah. So, and, and Brian works for me. So, <laughs> uh, let's see what they have upcoming events. Do they have any? List? Of course, this is the big event. Um, this is the Thursday evening meeting. Okay, we're here in the Friends Center. Um, no co-workings are scheduled. I can suggest that. Yeah. Uh, I can say in the past, just speaking to the past, they used to be scheduled on Friday afternoons um, in my office building, but the attendance went down. So we sort of said, well, let's let's um, stop them. But if there's an interest, we will start we'll start them back up. Yeah. Okay, there's also the Slack channel. Some of them are really active, but Drupal.org, um, if you go there, they've, they've listed a number of Slack channels. It's a good way to get a question answered. And then um, I would also, getting started, start with the distribution. Look for some, try them out. You're, you're going to want to note some distributions are more actively developed than others. Okay. Sorry, I was maybe a little bit late coming here. What's a distribution? <laughs> 
So let me, let's go to one. So here's a distribution, it's called Open Social. It's basically a package of Drupal configurations and modules already set up for you. Um, you do want to note over here, uh, this is small, I'm sorry for the folks in the back, how you, this gives you clues to how actively maintained it is. When was the last uh, commit? Um, this was one week ago, and this is pretty uh, active. And you can see, let's see if they have this down here. You can see a demo of this. And um, in the downloads, they'll also give you a clue of, is it, uh, is it recommended? Yeah. Some of them are on, some of them, the older ones become unsupported. Um, and that's it. That's questions, comments? Yeah. Um, do you have any sense of how many projects you don't get because people don't want to use Drupal? Mm -hmm. And what it, what do you, what's your take on that? Like, what are you doing? Yeah. So, um, so I do try to keep my eye on which projects are, are not going with the central campus solution. Um, and once in a while I will, I, I'll go out and reach out to the department and say, hey, you know, we had a solution, why did you choose X? Um, in some cases, it, it's, it's uh, the, the department has a in-house technical support person who might have already been familiar with another technology. So WordPress is probably the top one. And because they've had a familiarity with it, they would prefer to work with a WordPress vendor because they, they can support it uh, locally in-house. Um, I don't so much hear uh, Drupal, uh, Drupal as the reason they don't, they don't go with it. Um, I do, you being in the central office, uh, would you make a statement Drupal is the official university content management system only because um, one if a department had a Drupal site built with someone else they are in a jam this has happened a couple times too many times they can come to my group and I can take a look at the vendors code and, and make a best effort to help them how do you approach training for, for your different yeah, yeah. User types. I mean, people say I want to learn Drupal. Drupal is not like Word, but it's like yeah. a set instructions. You have to know what you want to achieve yeah. in order to figure out what you need, kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So how do you approach training mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. so that people can do it themselves? Yeah. Great question. We ha we offer a monthly training class. It's actually broken into three or four parts. Um, it's taught by Byron Veal. He's here at the conference. He's really great. So we do offer a training class. And sometimes we do get people who are repeat, they come back more than once to take the class as a refresher. Um, but yeah, we do train them. We do want them to be as self-sufficient as they can um, because we are uh, 16 people supporting a lot of sites. And uh, we, so we, we offer a training class we have, and we have documentation online. Anything else? Okay, so um, I'm, I'm here all day and I'm more than happy to talk about the, uh, we call it the Princeton Drupal template system. I could talk about that all day long. And um, I, can, I can tell you the, the, the nightmare stories about things I've seen vendors do and some, some gotchas, things to watch out for. But other than that, thank you for coming. Have a great day.